Good afternoon. My name is Brian Parks, and I serve as the senior pastor here at Covenant Hope Church. One of the most vivid memories that I have of growing up was the 10 meter by 10 meter plot of land that was in our backyard. In those 10 by 10 meters, my mother grew a vegetable garden, and she was good at it. She was what we would say, maybe it's a Western idiom, she had a green thumb. What that means is, of course, is that when she put her mind to the work of growing plants, she could make them grow. And boy, did they grow. One of my favorite things out of that vegetable garden were the tomatoes. There is nothing that you can buy in a store that is round and red that compares to a homegrown tomato. I mean, I love those tomatoes. When we would pick them and bring them in out of the vegetable garden, sometimes I would eat them like an apple. That's how much I like tomatoes. And it was amazing. It was amazing what would happen. Of course, at the beginning of the season, she would plant all the small plants there out in the vegetable garden, and the tomato plants were some of those that she would plant, really short and tiny, water them, fertilize them, tend to them, and gradually, week by week, day by day, they would grow taller and taller, a big, strong stalk, and of course, the branches would be coming off of them, and eventually, the the little yellow flowers on the tomato plant, and then those would drop off, and you would see the little green bud that would eventually grow larger and larger and larger and turn redder and redder and redder until, if you could keep them away from the birds we would pick them and have a delicious vegetable garden meal. I remember that vegetable garden because it relates to our passage today in John chapter 15, where there is a vine, and there are branches, and there is fruit. That's the image that Jesus is sharing with His disciples as he's gathered with them in the upper room on the night of the Passover weekend, just hours before Jesus would be betrayed and executed the next day on a cross. He's given them the shocking news that he would be leaving them to go to the Father, but that the Father would send the Holy Spirit, whom he also calls the Helper. The Spirit would be Jesus' constant presence living in them and reminding them of all that He had taught them. And at this point in His farewell address, there that evening, Jesus now turns to answer a pressing question that the disciples have. How should they live together as disciples of His if He's not there? How should they do that? And with that, Jesus introduces that vivid metaphor, a real-life image that the disciples will always be able to remember and keep at the forefront of their minds, guiding them in how to live as Jesus' disciples without Jesus physically there. A vine with branches attached to it, with fruit growing on it. Turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. This is the fourth of the gospel accounts in the New Testament. It was written by the man named John, not John the Baptist, but John the Apostle, John the disciple of Jesus. We're going to read... um, from verses 1 to 17 eventually, um, but I'm going to pray for us first before we even read. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask Him to help us understand this passage for our own lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, would the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in Your sight? O oh Lord, You are our rock our Redeemer. We trust in You. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. 
let's, my argument for this entire passage this afternoon, what I want to convince you of is that we should abide in Jesus to bear fruit for God's glory. Abide in Jesus to bear fruit for God's glory. That's the message in a nutshell. We're going to look at verses 1 through 8 first, and then we'll look at verses 9 through 17, and I'm going to read those separately so that we can focus on those and you can remember them really well as we begin to speak about them. So first of all, verses 1 through 8. Follow along with me in chapter 15 of John. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, He takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, He prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Well, we're looking at this parable that Jesus explains to His disciples. In verses 9 through 17, He's going to further explain the parable, but first He unfolds this parable for us. And the parable does drive home that argument that we are to abide in Jesus to bear fruit for God's glory. So the focus of these first eight verses is abide in Jesus just to bear fruit. Abide in Jesus to bear fruit. That's the first point in the two points of my sermon today. Abide in Jesus to bear fruit. Jesus introduces this new metaphor, and in doing it, He gives His disciples the seventh of the famous I am statements that we find in the Gospel of John. There have been seven statements throughout the book where Jesus says, I am, and then he completes the sentence with a description of himself. In each of those, when Jesus uses the term I am, he's actually saying that he is God. He's using a term that harkens back to actually the book of Exodus, where Moses stood on the mountain before the burning bush and asked the angel of the Lord, when I go to the Israelites and tell them that you have sent me to lead them out of captivity, who should I say spoke to me? And God says, tell them, I am that I am spoke to you. I am is who He is. So Jesus is saying more than just simple descriptions of Himself. He's saying God is like this. I am like this. And so these first six of the I am statements, the first was bread of life. I am the bread of life. Then He said, I am the light of the world. Then I am the door and I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection of life when he raised Lazarus from the dead. And in chapter 14, he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And now Jesus says, I am the true vine. And he says it again in verse 5, I am the vine. But you know, Jesus is not just picking out some simple metaphor just because he in walking along the road one day, saw a vine by the side of the road and thought, oh, that would be a helpful illustration to teach my disciples about what it means to live in me after I'm gone. 
No, this is an image or a metaphor that has a much deeper meaning to any Israelite who knew their Bible. Throughout the Old Testament, the nation of Israel is said to be a vine that God planted and nurtured so that it would produce beautiful, delicious, abundant fruit. Like a grapevine with huge clusters of grapes hanging off of it. That's what Israel was supposed to be. And so you heard about that when Jenny read from us from Isaiah 5 earlier in the service. Look back for just a moment to page 6 in your bulletins where that Scripture is typed out for you. Isaiah 5, and it's verses 1 through 7. This is God speaking. He's describing how He and love planted His vineyard Israel. But rather than bear good fruit, this vine bore wild grapes that were good for nothing. You couldn't make wine out of it. You couldn't eat them. They had to be thrown on the garbage heap. And he goes on to tell how he will destroy that vineyard in verses 5 and 6. And then in verse 7, he finally tells us explicitly what is the vine or who is the vine. Look there in verse 7, the very last verse again. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, and behold, bloodshed for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. Later, when we hold our hour-long prayer meeting, uh, maybe half an hour after this service ends, Lytton is going to be preaching to us from this particular verse, verse 7 in chapter 5. So I would encourage you to come back and hear more about how this is connected to the gospel in Christ. But this image of Israel as a vine is not just in Isaiah, but it's also scattered throughout the Old Testament. It's in Psalm 80. It's in the book of Jeremiah in multiple chapters. It's in the book of Ezekiel in multiple chapters as well. The nation of Israel was supposed to be the beautiful, prosperous, fruit-bearing vine of the Lord. But they failed. They did not bear good fruit. But Jesus is telling us that He's the true vine. In other words, He's saying, I'm the true Israel. I am the Son of the Father, just as God called Israel His Son, back in the book of Exodus and in other chapters and books in the Old Testament. But this is the Son, Jesus, who is the true vine. What Israel failed to do, Jesus has succeeded in every way. Jesus is the vine who produces beautiful, delicious, pleasing fruit for God's glory. He is the one who is obedient in every way to the Father. He says only what the Father tells Him to say. He does only what the Father tells Him to do. And from Him is flowing life. Jesus says that He's the true vine, and we see there in the second half of verse 1, that his father is the vine dresser. Now, that's kind of a funny word. The vine dresser is the farmer who day in and day out goes out into the vineyard and tends to the vine to make it more fruitful, just like my mother would go out into the garden and tend to those tomato plants. The vine dresser works carefully with the branches that are attached to the vine. Jesus is the vine, and the Father is the vine dresser. And of course, there in verse 5, Jesus tells His disciples that they are the branches. The branches are there to bear fruit. And the branches, of course, are not just those disciples that were in the upper room with Jesus. The branches are anyone who has repented of their sin and trusted in Christ. Any Christian is considered a branch that's connected to Jesus. As Jesus unfolds the metaphor and explains how the branches are connected to the vine, He uses that word abide over and over again. He begins using it by giving a command in verse 4, abide in me and I 
in you. He uses that word seven times in these first eight verses. Now, abide might not be a word that you use regularly in everyday conversation with your friends or your family, your roommates. I don't use it typically, but it's a good word because it's very descriptive. Some translations use the word remain, remain in me and I in you. Jesus is saying, when he uses the word abide, live in me, stay in me, dwell in me. He's saying, live in me, stay in me, remain connected to me. And that is the only way that you will be fruitful for God's glory. One of the strongest lessons from Jesus' teaching here is that we cannot bear any fruit for God's glory without living in and abiding in Jesus the vine. Anyone who is not a Christian, no matter what they do in their life, is not bearing any fruit that brings glory to God. Look again at verses 4 and 5. These are key verses. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. It's like he's repeated himself and said it in different ways, flipping the sentences around drilling at home in their hearts and their minds. Now, if abiding in Jesus is the secret to fruitfulness, then answering the question, how do we abide in Jesus, is perhaps the most important question to answer, isn't it? How do we remain in Jesus, who is with us only by the indwelling Spirit that He's given to each person who's repented and trusted in Him? To put it more simply, how do we live with someone that we can't see? The clues are actually right there in the passage. Look at verse 7 with me. Jesus says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Now, we can't see Jesus or the Spirit, but we can hear His words to us and we can speak to Him in return. Every Christian can do that. We abide in Jesus by carrying on a relationship with Him even though we can't see Him. We have to listen to His words in Scripture to us, and we have to respond to Him with words in prayer, praising Him, confessing to Him, and specifically what's mentioned here, asking Him to work in our lives and the lives of others so that more fruit is produced by us. Now think about what it means to live with another person. Every one of us has lived with other people. Maybe it was your family growing up or a spouse or a roommate that you have now. What happens if you never talk or listen to that other person? Maybe their schedule is so different than yours that you, you see evidence in your apartment that they live there. Their clothes are there. Maybe the bed's kind of disheveled. Uh, there might be some dirty dishes in the sink. You might have to talk about the rules of the house. Maybe there's even like a smell of the food that they cooked earlier before you woke up. But you don't ever see them. And you don't ever talk to them. If that's the case, then you don't have much of a relationship with that person. It's just a living arrangement, you could say. But if you see each other in the mornings and you listen to one another and you talk, or if you exchange text messages or phone calls throughout the day, if you then gather when you come home from work and you cook together and recount to one another what happened during your day, if you wind down in the evenings 
with conversation and you say good night to one another before you turn out the light and lay your head on the pillow. Now you have an ongoing, real, deep relationship. You're, you're really living with each other. Bearing godly fruit in our lives depends on you and I carrying on a daily conversational relationship with Jesus. It's actually very simple. There is no other way to grow as a Christian and bear gospel fruit that brings glory to God than to live day in and day out as if Jesus were right there with you, speaking to you and listening to you speak to Him. You just will not grow. I promise you. The more you cultivate a constant awareness of Jesus being with you by listening to His Word, speaking to Him in prayer, then the more that you will begin to see fruit born in your life, the kind of fruit that brings glory to God. Now, of course, you and I need to listen to Christ in His Word, in the Bible. That's where we find His Word. You need more Bible, I promise you. Every single one of you needs more Bible. I need more Bible. But you need to not just consume data, sentences, paragraphs, chapters, books. You need to read it and hear it with a soft heart. That, that cracks it open every day, trusting that Jesus is there whether it's early morning or you're opening up at your lunch break or you're reading and trying to memorize a verse off of an index card that's taped to your windshield as you drive to work or you open up your Bible and read a psalm before you go to bed. You need to believe that Jesus is there and He's speaking through these words, no matter whether Moses wrote those words or David wrote those words or Paul wrote those words, the entire Bible is Jesus' words to us because He's the one who inspired those men to write it down. You will not bear much fruit if you never develop a daily pattern of conversation with Jesus, listening to Him and speaking to Him. I remember that's one of the things I learned when I was in university. I had become a Christian at the age of 16, and one of the first things I learned was, and here was the terminology they used, how to have a daily quiet time. You can use whatever terminology you want, but somehow to spend time with God every day in His Word, listening and responding in prayer. It's changed my life and it'll change your life as well. Many of you might say about yourselves, Brian, I'm not really much of a reader. Maybe I'm not a reader. And I want to encourage you not to say that. (laughs) If you can read, you can become more and more of a reader. And when we read the Bible or we read good Christian books that are explaining the Bible to us, we are really gathering more Christian conversation partners into our life. So right now, I have a Christian conversation partner in Dallas Willard who is actually a man who's dead because I'm reading one of his books. I'm reading a book by a seminary professor named Steve Wellam. I have had very little conversation with Steve in the last five years, but every day we're talking together. He's teaching me. I'm even listening to another dead man named John Calvin. He lived 500 years ago because I'm reading his words, and he's explaining Scripture to me, the truths of Christ. Oh, brothers and sisters, you can grow in reading. And you must if you want to take in God's Word. Don't just collect books. Turn off the TV set. Set the phone down. Close out the browser. Train your mind to focus and listen for longer periods. Oh, friends, I know how hard it is. 
I think over the last 20 years, I've been trained by the internet to want to read short snippets, and that's all. I can't tell you how many times I've started a chapter in a book and I think, oh, how much longer is it? So we have to retrain ourselves, right? Immerse yourself in God's Word. Spend time with listening to Jesus there. We also abide in Jesus together, not just individually. We gather to listen to His words when we're together, like right now. These two hours or so that we spend together every Sunday afternoon are so crucial to abiding in Jesus. When we gather in a small group, perhaps, during the middle of the week to consider God's Word together, to pray together, we're abiding together with Him. Abiding in Jesus together reinforces and spurs us on to abide in Jesus when we're all alone. We need that. So abiding with Jesus means having a daily conversational relationship with Him that's both individual and something that we do together in the church. There's a few more things I want to point out to you in these first eight verses. It's so, so very rich. And the first of these two is that God's pruning in our life makes us more fruitful in Christ. Look there at the last half of verse 2. You may have wondered what that was all about when it was read. Jesus says, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that is the vine dresser, that it may bear more fruit. Pruning is cutting off unfruitful parts of a branch in order to allow it to bear more fruit. So several times a year, I'll come downstairs for breakfast, and I'll sit at my kitchen table and look up at what I thought was this beautiful green tree that's right near my kitchen window where the birds perch. But it's no longer green, and it looks like just an empty stick. And you know what's happened is that Joanne has been on a pruning binge. She's gone and taken her shears, and she's clipped it off. And there's literally no leaves on it. And you'd think that maybe it would die, but it doesn't. Over and over and over again, that tree that looks like just a stick stuck in the ground begins to bud and sprout more branches and pretty soon more leaves. And all of a sudden, a few months later, it's just as bushy and green as it was before. God doesn't just help us grow by adding things to our life. Often, He's also looking to subtract things in our lives. He needs to prune something from us. He needs to cut it away. And often, that's some kind of sin, some kind of distraction, perhaps, something that's not necessarily sin in and of itself, but it's keeping us and holding us back from abiding in Jesus more fully, more richly. It's keeping us from listening to Jesus, talking more to Jesus. Brothers and sisters, it is painful to be pruned by God. Sometimes pruning happens in our lives when we encounter hardships and trials that come upon us. And those are brought by God. The Scriptures are clear. Every trial in your life is there to ultimately help you grow in your trust in God and your fruitfulness before Him. What is God bringing to your attention that you need to have cut out of your life that's keeping you from being more fruitful in Christ? What is it? Have you asked Him? Are you asking the Lord to prune things from your heart and life that prevent you from being more fruitful for Him? That's a good prayer to pray. Are you cooperating with His pruning work or are you resisting His pruning in you? It makes me think of something else that Joanne does as a nurse, and that is give shots to children. <laughs> they don't like shots. And sometimes they have to be restrained and held down. Oh, brothers and sisters, when God is pruning us, 
I know I tend to flail around. I don't want the pruning to happen, but we need it. And God's doing it in love in our lives. Lastly, we can't move on from these verses without paying close attention to the strong warning that's here. It's mentioned first in verse 2, and then in greater detail in verse 6. In verse 2, he says that there are branches that bear no fruit, and those are taken away. Then down in verse 6, he says, Anyone who does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered thrown into the fire and burned. The warning is that there will be eternal judgment for anyone not found to be abiding in Jesus and producing fruit. The proof that you are truly born again is like what Shannel, our service leader, said to you earlier in the service, and I can add to it. The proof is not that you say simply you're a Christian. Maybe you are a Christian if you say you're a Christian. If you are a Christian, you do need to say you're a Christian. It's not whether or not you've been baptized. That's not the proof. It's not whether you were born to parents who considered themselves Christians. It is whether there is godly fruit in your life that comes from abiding in Jesus. The fruit is the proof. Now, the consequences couldn't be greater for this warning. Your eternal destiny hangs on whether you are remaining in Jesus or not. Just as Jesus Himself said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Me. Oh, friend, if you are listening to these words of Jesus and you're realizing it's dawning on you maybe for the first time, maybe it's confirming a lingering doubt that you've had. Am I really a Christian? Because you look in your life and there's no fruit. There's no love for Jesus. There's no desire to follow Him. Turn to Christ now. Run to Him. Listen, cry out to Him. Turn from your sin and trust in Him. You can change that right now. Sin has turned each of us into rebels against God, and the punishment for our treasonous living is to be thrown into the fire and burned. It will happen. It is a promise. But Jesus went to the cross to receive in His own body the punishment that we deserved. His death can be the death payment that you owe, and His life can be the eternal life that you cannot lose if you turn and trust in Him. Believe in Jesus. Become a branch connected to the vine. Well, the title of the first point is Abide in Jesus to Bear Fruit. That's for the first eight verses. But what is the fruit? Jesus hasn't answered that, has He? And what more is there to abiding an abiding relationship with Jesus other than listening to His words and speaking to Him in prayer? Well, we hear Jesus explain the metaphor and answer those questions in verses 9 through 17. Let's read those together now. Verses 9 through 17. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you 
so that you will love one another. Do you see how many times Jesus refers to the importance of obeying His commands in these verses? Verse 10, He says, if you keep My commandments, and He likens it to the way He's kept His Father's commandments. In verse 12, He says, this is My commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. We've heard this back in chapter 13. He's already told them. I guess they needed to hear it again. In verse 14, he says, you're my friends if you do what I command you. It's an interesting kind of friendship. In verse 17, these things I command you so that you will love one another. An important key to abiding in Jesus is not just listening to and speaking to Jesus, but intentionally setting out to obey Him. Obeying is absolutely necessary part of abiding in Jesus. The Bible teacher Dallas Willard that I mentioned to you earlier says in his book, The Great Omission, the missing note in the church today is obedience. We have created a variety of religion where obedience is not regarded as essential. He continues, life in Christ has to do with obedience to His teaching. And so I ask you, do you listen to Jesus in His Word and ask for things from Him with your goal being to obey Him? Not listening to Him maybe simply for inspiration, not simply looking for something uplifting. It's wonderful when that happens, but sometimes and often it doesn't not listening for words that make you necessarily feel good about yourself, maybe you'll hear words that are convicting. But listening to Jesus' words for something to obey. Jesus makes it clear here. If you want to remain in His love, set out to obey Him. And chief among His commands is to love one another. But he tells us more about what love looks like, doesn't he? It's not simply warm feelings for another person. It's not personal attraction to another person. That's a worldly definition of love. We need to get our definition of love from Jesus because He is love. In fact, neither one of those things, warm feelings, personal attraction, they're, they're not really necessary for us to love each other. In fact, liking each other isn't even particularly necessary, although I suspect if, the, if we begin loving one another, God will conjure up in our hearts like for one another. It's easier to love one another when those things are there, but it's not necessary. Jesus defines and describes love for us here, doesn't He? He defines it by saying, look there in verse 9, as the Father has loved me. And then in verse 12, He says, as I have loved you. How did Jesus love His disciples? Well, we know He's loved them up to this point, but His greatest demonstration of love is going to happen that very next day. Verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. This is the definition of love. The love that Jesus commands us to demonstrate among ourselves is self-sacrificing love. The kind of selflessness that motivates, motivated Jesus to willingly go to the cross and be crucified for them that very next day, to shed His blood, to breathe His last. Now we're beginning to get a picture of what the fruit is that's born in the life of a disciple who's abiding in Christ. It's self-sacrificing love and the myriad, various, multiple ways that that can be demonstrated in our lives toward one another. There are so many ways. 
Earlier in his farewell message to the disciples, back in chapter 13, Jesus said about their love for one another, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And we saw in verse 8 in that first section that the fruit that would be born in their lives proves that you are his disciples. Those sentences are very much alike. Of course, we're even to love our enemies. We know that from other passages in the Bible. But Jesus is not talking to the crowds now. He's talking just to His disciples. And so the message is just for their relationships with one another. And if you read the rest of the Gospels, you will see that they had trouble loving one another. And so will we. The way to live out church membership, meaningful church membership, is to intentionally be going about the business of loving one another. Are you looking to the interests of others or your own first? Are you thinking of other people in the church and how you might love them? You know, even we even do things like take good care of ourselves, eat proper meals of good food, go to bed at a decent hour, take care of your responsibilities. We do all those things in many ways just so that we can lay the groundwork and direct the bulk of our energy and our time towards serving others in love. That's why we do those things. There's a reason why Jesus said the greatest commandments were love God and love your neighbor. And we love each other in so many different ways. We could spend hours and hours talking about it. There's there's the all-important forgiving one another. Are you holding a grudge against someone in the church? Maybe you're assuming something about their motives that you don't really know. Let it go. Let it go. Jesus has forgiven us for far more than we'll ever have an opportunity to forgive others for. What about seeking to do one another spiritual good through conversations about important things? Asking good questions of people. How their walk with Christ is going. How you can pray for them. What about Praying simply through the directory. It's just a simple little thing. It will help you learn names as our church grows a little bigger. And it's one simple way to love people that you might not sit next to on a regular basis or know very deeply in a personal way. What about rebuking and exhorting one another? That's one other way that we love each other. To ward one another off from sin to help one another abide in Christ more and more. Look, we, we don't do that with a prideful attitude, do we? But we do it in love for each other's good. Believe me, it's easier not to rebuke a friend, isn't it? Apart from Jesus' example of selfless love, I'd rather not risk you resenting me when I rebuke you for some sin. And so rebuke requires the courage to risk the relationship in love for your sake. We do it humbly. Those and so many other ways are ways that we love one another in self-sacrificing ways. Now, there's another stunning truth that Jesus reveals to us here in these verses that even though He demands obedience... Jesus calls you and I friends. Now, what an amazing truth to consider. That the Word made flesh, the Son of God who spoke and the world was created, He calls you friend. Look at, look at verse 15. He says, No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I've made known to you. Jesus tells us that our intimacy with God is not like other friendships we have here with other humans. (laughs) It's different. 
Rather, it's based on the fact that Jesus reveals Himself to us. That's what makes us Jesus' friend. Here's an important point to remember. Obeying Jesus doesn't make us friends with God, but experiencing the joy and love and satisfaction of having intimacy with God does depend on obeying. Did you get that? Obeying Jesus doesn't make us friends. But enjoying and experiencing the joy and love and satisfaction of that friendship does depend on obeying Him. It keeps us in His love, remaining in His love, abiding in His love. We experience the joy of walking in the love of Jesus to the degree that we walk in obedience to Him, even in hard times, even when the Father is pruning us so that we'll be more fruitful. Disobeying Jesus robs us of joy, removes us from God's love. Joy and friendship with God are what Jesus offers to us once we've trusted in Him. But what if we don't feel close to God? Have we lost a connection with Him? Mike McKinley has a new book that he's published called Friendship with God, and in it he draws on the teaching of a long-dead Puritan theologian, John Owen. And Owen says, he quotes him saying, Our communion then with God consists in His communication of Himself unto us with our return unto Him of that which He requires and accepts, flowing from that union which in Jesus Christ we have with Him. Now, John Owen is a little difficult to understand. Let me break it down for you. There's two important words in this statement, union and communion. He's saying that our communion, the experience of our relationship with Jesus, flows from our union or our connection with Jesus that's based on His blood shed for us and cannot be broken. So our experience of the relationship flows from that established binding connection. He has secured it for us. He did it on the cross and in His resurrection. Look at verse 16. Jesus says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. Jesus initiated the friendship that you have with Him. You weren't looking for friendship with Him before that. You, you may have been interested in religion. You may have thought of yourself as spiritual. Listen, everyone's spiritual. They have a soul. But you were not interested in loving and obeying Jesus before you repented and trusted in Him. But He chose you. He knew everything about you. He knew all your sin. And He sent people into your life so that you would learn who He is and what He did for you on the cross. And He touched your heart in such a way that through the Holy Spirit, you were convinced of His love for you and your need for that friendship with the Savior. Oh, brothers and sisters, this should humble us. Don't be proud that you're a Christian. Be amazed that you're a Christian. Be thankful that you're a Christian. Pride presumes that somehow it's your doing. Thankfulness assumes that it's all His doing. And that's all about our unbreakable union with Christ, no matter whether you're feeling it or not. But our communion, it can ebb and flow. It can fade and be strengthened. And so when Owen says, return unto Him of that which He requires and accepts, he's saying that we return unto Him by strengthening our communion with Jesus in prayer and, and obedience, loving Him, delighting in Him, doing all the things that we do together as a church, like taking the Lord's Supper together, baptizing people, singing together. Jesus was referring to the disciples' union with Him when He told them back in verse 3, already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. They were His. They couldn't be lost. You have been cleaned from the debt of sin that you have 
if you've trusted in Christ. If you've trusted in Christ, then you have union with Him and you're able to have communion with Him. So if you are a branch that is connected to Jesus the vine, draw near to Him. Return unto Him that which He accepts and requires, as John Owen says. In Jesus, you always have someone who loves you perfectly, ready to listen and speak words of instruction or correction or comfort to you. If you are in Christ, you are never without a friend. When crisis comes, who among us doesn't reach out to someone that we call friend, but do we call out to the friend of sinners? Do we turn to the creator of the universe who laid down his life for us? Strengthen your communion with Jesus and your habit of abiding in Him by training yourself to turn to Him in prayer throughout the day and especially when hard times come. Now, there's a clue here in verse 16 about the nature of the fruit that's born in and through us. Of course, the fruit can be anything that God works in us, a greater desire for holiness, power in the Spirit to repent of sin and be done with it, uh, a deeper understanding of His Word that equips us to help others grow and to rejoice in Him. That's all fruit that could be born in us. But verse 16 says that the fruit that we bear, or he says about that fruit, that your fruit should abide. Now, that's interesting. If it should abide like we abide in Him, then perhaps the primary fruit that He's referring to are new converts who have heard the gospel from us and repented and trusted in Christ. That would be the mission that Jesus is going to send these apostles out to do, to bear witness to Him, to proclaim that He is the way and the truth and the life, and that no one comes to the Father but through Him. Evangelism and missions are aspects of the Christian life that are for everyone, brothers and sisters. Not just a few that we think of as, oh, that guy's an evangelist. Or, oh, wow, she is so interested in missions. That's for all of us. If Jesus promises that whatever you ask the Father in my name, He may give it to you, then why shouldn't we pray regularly and with great zeal for our lost friends? and family members, that they would be saved? And why shouldn't we look for opportunities, maybe even create opportunities with them to read the Bible together and explain the gospel? Evangelism and missions should be on all our hearts and steps that we're all taking. There may even be opportunities to share the gospel with someone in the minutes after this gathering is over if we're ready and aware enough. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. The Father is the vine dresser. Every branch that doesn't bear fruit, He takes away. Every branch that does bear fruit is pruned so that it might bear more fruit. Don't forget the message of Jesus for you. Abide in Him to bear fruit for God's glory. That's who we are and what we joyfully do as brothers and sisters in Christ. May He make us more fruitful together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise You that You are causing fruit to be born in our lives. Lord, I think about our church. I flip through our church directory, and I think of the fruit when I go from picture to picture to picture to picture. And I praise You. Lord, we pray that You would cause that fruit to be even more plentiful. Lord, help us abide in Your Son, Christ. Help us nurture that communion with Him that's made possible by what He did on the cross and in the resurrection. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's sing about this Jesus who has loved us as the Father has loved Him Let's sing, O Fount of Love. It's in your bulletin. Please stand with me.